welcome to this week's episode of Frost Sessions, the Frost School of Music's official podcast. Our premiere episode features our very own Dean Shelley Berg. He will dive into the history of jazz with Emmy award-winning and Grammy-nominated host of Sirius XM Real Jazz, Mark Ruffin. Shelley and Mark explore the intersection of jazz, racial intolerance, and baseball, and how it all fits into the world of today. Thank you for joining us, and remember to stay tuned to Frost Sessions. Well, hi, this is Shelley Berg, and uh, we're doing Frost Sessions with a very special guest today, a, a good friend and an amazing person. Uh, welcome, Mark Ruffin. Hey, Shelley. This, uh, the tables are turned, in a way. You're, <laughs> you're talking to me. I'm being interviewed by you. It's yeah, different. well, it's, it's interesting. You know, I'm the dean of the school. I'm kind of like the, you know, the head of the, of the organization here, but I actually work for you in my other life because <laughs> because you're my boss at Sirius. <laughs> and Shelly, your, your life is so amazing. I'm, I'm not your only boss, I, I, and I don't know how you do it, but you, you're also with the cruise people. You, yeah. You're doing all that arranging, and you're doing the Grammy arranging. I mean, you know, and you, so I'm just one of your bosses, one of many. Well, well you're a good one. <laughs> and, I, and I love getting the chance to work with you and, uh, and do uh, some radio for Sirius XM. Um, so I was just fascinated to read your book, uh, Bebop Fairy Tales, and uh, I definitely want to, you know, steer our conversation towards that in a minute, but, but, uh, but it'd be fun to go back and talk about a little bit about your life and how it led to Bebop Fairy Tales. And, you know, wow. I read that your father had a, had a, a store that was kind of a combination record store and, uh, and, and, uh, repair store for for electronic equipment right yes yes he uh he was an electrician had a full-time job at a steel mill as an electrician there and oh it wasn't a steel mill but they made things with steel and am castle was the name of the company but he um and he had a store a record store and he fixed to draw people in he had television fixed television and uh, radios i i'm i'm the fifth of um, no, three brothers and two sisters. No, that's backwards. I'm sorry. I have three sisters and two brothers. So I'm the fifth, the sixth. I was the second youngest. So all of us kind of learn how to uh, troubleshoot. Yeah. You know, when the customers come in, we were all involved from a very young age. And I grew up in a record store. Uh, you know, electricity was his, electrician was his, was what he did for a living, but records brought people in. And I mean, I was there, man. And that's, that's really what led me into radio, Shelley. Absorbed by music from a very young age. Yeah. yeah. Because in those, you know, in those days, it was records. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was roughing records and TV, you know? I love it. Our, the first store was on 15th and Sawyer in Chicago. The second store was 1651 South Pulaski Road. I remember that. I even remember the phone number, man. Rockwell two nine two nine one. Remember, you used to have words. Oh, sure. Rockwell. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So, it, was so it, it, it was a big stamp on my life. And um, did the store carry all kinds of records? You know, like the everything. Okay, Shelley. My a lot of people don't know about my writing life. A lot of people know about uh, me being on the radio. September first yeah. is my fortieth anniversary coming up oh, oh, is, um, is my anniversary, 40th anniversary. And all of that stems from the record store and just by osmosis, I got into the music business. I did all that, but I knew I was gonna be a writer at a young age and it was Smokey Robinson. He's the first person I think in my book because when I was young, my brothers and sisters, I mean, that record store was amazing. And, and we, we danced, and my sister Connie, she was the wordsmith. And we sat down and we learned how to read and write through Curtis Mayfield and Smokey Robinson songs because they, so many of the records coming in were produced and written by those two guys. Oh, yeah. And Smokey Robinson taught me how to turn a phrase. And that's, that's what I say in the book. You know? Wow, and Smokey's still performing. I know, man, and I've had a chance to hang out with him in my in my career. I had to, oh man, I had three great Smokey Robinson stories. So <laughs> yes, I mean, and and Shelley, and you must experience this to hang out with people that you admired when you were young. Oh yes, yeah. 
S. And for me, Smokey. Yeah. Yeah. I have a great picture of a uh, me and him with a cub. I, I'm in a cub uniform, and he's uh, you know, he's a vegetarian, and he's in a kind of vegetarian T-shirt. Yes. That's great. So um, um. So how did your then? then how did your career start going? Because it was in writing before it was in broadcasting. So how did okay. that happen for you? So, so Smokey, and I mean, music was my thing, man. I, I just, I mean, I have a friend who says I have a phonographic memory. I mean, <laughs> I know people can't see in the podcast, but there's 5,000 CDs behind me, you know? And, and, and actually a lot of people don't know, I know more about R&B than I do jazz. That's reflected in the book in the last story a lot. Yeah, yeah. R&B part of it. Yeah. Okay, and, and it's just music. I absorbed it, man. And just so happens, I found my lane in broadcasting. All of it was osmosis. Music has protected me. The, the first story that I remember with music protected me. I was about, it's a family legend. In fact, the NEA does a nice little anim animation of it. If you Google my name and the National Endowment, they have an animation of this story where, um, I was four or five with my mom and she was in the record store. A guy came in with a woman and he pulled a gun on my mom and he had a woman on the other side, go get radios and TVs, whatever she could carry. And then they came over to the records on the four, on the uh, little record player. Remember those? Sure. <laughs> it was a 45 single of Miles Davis. If I were a bell where he says, I play it now, I'll tell you what it is later. Okay, and then it was, you know, he states the melody, then yeah. he solos, Coltrane solos, it rejects and comes back. And as long as I remember, as long as that guy came back and said that, I felt that we would get through this. It was very intense. And like I said, my, one of my first memories, man. And uh, from that moment on, music seems to have protected me, right? Um, but again, writing, starting um, with Smokey, I started writing poetry. I started learning music. I wanted to be piano player at first, Shelly. I wanted to have your gig at first, just <laughs> like you want mine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I wanted to be a piano player. And then I, then I started playing bass. Um, um, and uh, I played bass through high school. I was in band camps. I went, I'm went. a student of the band camp, man. I went to band camp with uh, Pat Metheny, Gary Burton, Illinois State, like 73, I was a junior maybe wow. and, uh, in high school. And Gary Burton told me, you, you, you need some work son on that bass. I never, and so as I grew into the business, I always teased him a little bit. But every night, man, he and Pat Metheny, wow. you know, in that band with Bob Moses, they played every night. And, and boy, Pat Metheny, University of Miami. Well, University. yeah, he's, uh, he's, he's one of our, uh, we're so proud uh, to, of the association. He's one of yeah, the, and, he's, and, and somebody else with the University of Miami Association changed my life was Jocko, man. Jocko. So, so, so I started out as a classical bassist. You'd be, you'd, it's interesting to know. I mean, cause that's where I was. And then the band, we had a jazz band. You may know somebody, you know, Doug Beach? Very well. Doug Beach went to Proviso East High School, man. Elmhurst we, College. That's right. El, okay. <laughs> so before Elmhurst College in Elmhurst, Illinois, he was at Proviso East where I was in Maywood, Illinois. I, I, in, in the uh, jazz band was his brother, uh, Dave Beach, who was a drummer. Yeah. You know, not I've, as good as Doug. I've yeah. known Doug for decades. Last time yeah, I man. played played there, I was with Patty Austin at Elmhurst. Wow. <laughs> wow. That is something, man. Talk about the crossover between R and B and jazz. That's Patty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's she's another one who music has protected all her life. It's like a spirit, man. You know, and, and if the spirit, if if you go with it and and be creative as possible, it seems like the spirit protects you. You know, which has kind of been my life. Um, it's happened to me I, too many times. I, I've been protected by music. Are you, you know? kidding? Your your life reflects it. So I was trying to get to the writing part because um, music was mostly what I did. And then I fell into, I was at a school, a, another point that changed my life with a, a guy who now lives in Florida, Chick Corea. I saw Return to Forever. I was at Southern Illinois University. Yeah. I was a, I was a bass major and um, I saw Stanley Clark and he did a run and it oh just, I just, I knew I couldn't do it. And the school I was at happened to be a good broadcasting school. 
it was Southern Illinois University to this day, one of the best schools in broadcasting. And, and I learned enough there, man, working at two radio stations. Also there, I became the student uh, editor of the black student newspaper. Wow. Uhuru Sasa was the name of the paper. So th then again, I was even writing back then. Yeah. But um, so that's, that's how I got into broadcasting, man. Again, just an extension of, of being in that record store and growing and loving music. And I found my lane. I like to tell some kids, if people who are looking for direction, um, sometimes if you can find your lane and specialize, sometimes you can get over, you know? And, and that's what happened to me in jazz and journalism, man. Um, I found my lane. I could have been tried to be an R&B jock. I mean, cause I was good and still very knowledgeable today. I kind of, in the 80s and 90s, lost my way in R&B and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, but before that, okay. But, but jazz seemed more sophisticated to me. I, I knew as much about that as I knew R&B. And, and when I found that lane, uh, I, just went, I just didn't let it go. And my love of writing came in when my first, my first job, as I mentioned, September 1st, 1980 was at WBEZ. I was an operation engineer. And, and it was yeah, an NGR. Yeah, the electronics too, right? From yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, man. Yes. That's how I got, I had a first class <laughs> license. I had a first, and to get a third class license, the, when, when I got the pamphlet, which is a great story too, it was the same stuff my father taught us when we were troubleshooting yeah. uh, stuff to come in. So that was my entry into radio. I had a first class license. I had an engineering job at a jazz station, WBEZ. Uh, yeah. And um, there's a guy you may know, Howard Mandel. You know Howard Mandel? Sure, of course. Okay, today Howard Mandel is the executive director of the Jazz Journalists Association, yeah, right? Yeah. But in 1980, he was president of the Jazz Institute of Chicago. And in 1980, before I had the job, I already was volunteering, another great way to get into things, volunteering. Right. I was volunteering at two radio stations. This is such a crazy story and how music has protected me. I was volunteering at two radio stations, WRRG in, in River Grove, Illinois, which was Triton College, and WDCB College of DuPage out in, in suburban Illinois. And then I got this, well, how I got the job at WBEZ and even um, getting on the air. So I was at the post office, Shelly, working at these two stations, had my first class license. I started going to, to stations just walking in. I got a first class license. And the guy who I, who I worked with volunteering at WRRG in Triton, when I went into WBEZ, they told me they didn't have a job for me. And when I walked out of WBEZ, there was this guy from WRRG. He said, Ruffin, what are you doing here? I said, I'm trying to get a job. He walked me right back into the engineer, the guy who just told me there was no job. He said, dude, this is the guy you want, reliable and all that. And, and, and suddenly I had a job, be easy. At the time, Shelly, I was also volunteering, as I mentioned, WRG and WDCB at College of DuPage, where I devised a show called Jazz Talk. I figured if I interviewed folks and interviewed local people, I could write up the interviews. There was a twist in local people didn't have any time for me, but the national people were coming in and they were actually looking for people to talk. So my first few shows was like, I remember Spyro Gyra and Ralph Pounder and Matheny. And, and so suddenly I had this national um, uh, uh, public radio show, interview show. Yeah. And Howard Mandel heard it, but he was working for WBEZ in the city where I was an engineer. And he came up with this show, Jazz Chicago. Judy Roberts was the first person oh, I interviewed. Wow. And that was my first professional on air experience. I was already engineering, yeah. but then so so I have to give it to Howard Mandel, you know, that who gave me my first on air experience. But also that led to journalism. So um, I also used that interviews, those interviews to approach papers, newspapers and different music magazines. And this guy at Illinois Entertainer Magazine, who I also give credit to in the, in, in the, mm -hmm. at the beginning of the book, his name is Guy Arnston. He said, dude, you have a voice. 
And he told me that, I believed it. My first article was Chick Corea and Gary Burton's, their names are again. And, um, and from there on, I was writing. Again, music protected me. I, the assistant editor of this paper, Illinois Entertainer, uh, became a music editor at Chicago Magazine, who had just lost, lost their jazz editor. Dude, I, had just, I was just getting started, 1981, 1982. And suddenly, I was the jazz editor of Chicago Magazine. Suddenly, man, because I found that lane and journalism, yeah. you, you know, a lot of people write and they have to do, um, you know, you have to show people what you know. But because suddenly I was jazz editor of Chicago Magazine, I could call up magazines. I didn't even have to do queries, man. He said, okay, let's do it. And that's how the journalism started from there on. I, you mentioned like four things that if people are thinking about younger people, like the ones we teach, thinking about a career. Number one, you weren't afraid to go out and volunteer and learn from others and give of yourself. Number two, you were reliable and people could count on you. You had, and you had, you had trained, so you had expertise to do what you were doing. Number three, you were proactive. You went out, you know. And number four, because of all those other th three things, you had mentors and champions for you. And all those things, Jump started you into a career, and when young people are thinking about how to have a career, well, there's a there's a blueprint right there, it, Shelley. And and that blueprint didn't stop to this day. I mean, I've had mentors and music protecting me and being right. A, another great story, just um, reputation. So there was a time I worked in smooth jazz, W N U A in Chicago, eight and a half years. I, I'm not ashamed to say now I spent half that time trying to get out, but. <laughs> But at the time, I had a journalism career and a writing career that, you know, subsidized everything I wanted to do. I was fortunate in radio in that I had journalism, you know, wasn't a lot of money, but compared, you know, I always had a radio job, always. So I always had that side hustle to do. Um, but in eight and a half years at WNUA, I was known to always be there. A few years later, man, when Oprah, got into uh, Sirius XM, I was trying to get in. I, I, I had an in, I was trying, I couldn't get in. I couldn't get in at all. And then when they announced it, I had heard about it before, but when they announced that XM had this partnership with Oprah, they hired my general manager at WNUA, where I had this reputation of being late twice in two years. This is honest to truth, how I got the gig at Oprah. Wow. At Oprah, Harper. I called him up, I, his name is John Guerin. I said, John, it's Mark Ruffin. Oh my God, Mark Ruffin, you're perfect. Call me in two weeks. And dude, that is how I got hired at Harpo Radio, okay? Being reliable, having that reputation of being there, knowing and showing up every day, you know? There it is, there, there are the lessons, you know? So what There's was the Chicago, Chicago scene like when you were a kid with music? What were you, what were you checking out there? I mean, were you, were you hearing local people? Okay, well, well, I was consumed with R&B and jazz. Back when we were growing up, man, I mean, I, I don't, I really don't know how, how we're old you are. We're basically the same age. I'm a little older oh. than you by a few months. Okay, so you know how important pop radio was and, oh, yeah. and R&B radio, and not only playing the singles, but I don't know where you grew up, but many of the uh, stations where I was, pop and R&B stations, would tag the hour, fill the hour with an instrumental or a jazz tune. Yeah. And jazz tunes could become big hits. I mean, there's many examples of them, you know? Right. You know, from, from, from Eddie Harrison with uh, Exodus in the 50s, 50s, maybe the last one to successfully do it was Spyro Gyra in, in, in the late 80s. But, you know, jazz, you, you used to get, get hits with jazz. So I was absorbed by both of them, R&B and, and jazz and, and just records. That's what I was into. When I, got to, when I started playing, I got to college, that's when I started seeing a lot of live bands. Oh, no, 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 and I should back up, high school, oh my gosh. High school, man, I was really, again, it was a different time. My mom trusted me. As long as I got my grades, as long as I got my grades, and, and, and we had no danger. So I saw great shows, but again, mostly R&B. I remember seeing War and Isaac Hayes together for like $4.50. You know, Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Funkadelic, yeah, yeah. you know. Very, very cheap. 
I, I got into, I, it's hard how I got into jazz going to see jazz because I was always going, my first show was Smokey Robinson at the Regal Theater in Motown. My mom, the story in the family is I made my mom take me to see Smokey. <laughs> but I saw Smokey, Marvin Gaye, uh, wow. Martha and the Vandellas and the Contours. I still remember what they, you know, some of the things. It was such an impression. And I, and I remember almost Smokey's whole set, okay? Um, when, when I started playing in high school, and I grew up with Herbie's cousins, by the way. Okay, huh. Herbie's, Herbie's cousin yeah, and he's from Herbie. Chicago. Yes, oh, Jeffrey and Greg Hancock. And again, Greg Hancock and Doug Beach, they were very tight in high school. So we, well, we had this major musician thing. And through them, I started going out and seeing, again, mostly national acts, mm -hmm. um, free college. I saw a lot of national jazz. My first, my first jazz show was a jazz showcase. I made Joe Siegel. I made him, I begged him, man. It was Bobby Hutcherson. And he had a place, he had a place at his place on Rush Street where, you know, he, if the cops came, there was an easy way out, right? <laughs> and Bobby Hutcherson was my first show. <laughs> what's, what's funny, Shelly, I thought I was so special that Joe did that for me. And you know, he just passed away yeah. last month. Great NEA jazz master, owner of the, Chicago, mm -hmm. the jazz showcase. I found out I wasn't special. He did that to a lot of people, yeah, who, yeah. you know, who were pre preteen. So Joe Siegel was my entry into seeing people. He was a and hero. Joe Siegel yes, was a hero. Absolutely. Yeah. And through him, I got to know local people. Because um, many times local people backed up um, national acts. Right. And through, and through the Hancocks, I got to know Southside musicians. A -A I came in through a different way. AACM, I really liked avant-garde music as a player yeah. when I first started to play. As a player, I, I came in that way. Um, in school, I got into the jazz bands. And, and then college, my mind exploded with, because it, I went to a, a big university and, and jazz folks started coming in national and local. And then when I got out of college and got into radio, I started seeing the local scene in Chicago. And it was vibrant, man, back then. Absolutely. So many people. You know, you worked with a, a wonderful gentleman um, who I just think is one of the, really one of the nicest people I've ever known and just a great trailblazing artist. I'm talking about Ramsey Lewis. <laughs> and I, it, you know, if I had kept talking instead of waiting for you to ask the question, I would have led to him anyway. <laughs> because um, again, as a, as a young man getting into the scene and knowing local people, it was, it was a lot of folks after his trio broke up, he hired a lot of local musicians, a lot of young guys. He always had the young guys in his, during his, uh, his Earth, Wind & Fire pop stage after that. Henry Johnson's a good name I could think of, guitar player. Yeah, um, wonderful guitar player. And, and, um, and then I did work for him. Um, it was an amazing experience. He was such a mentor to me in not only just, it's amazing how, you know, in my life as, as musicians know, I, if you know a lot about them, they warm up to you. So I, I had that part of Ramsey already. He, he loved that I knew history. Yeah. But he, taught, he taught me how to live. He taught me different things about how to conduct yourself in the music business. Um, you, Shelly, you've had classy folks who are mentors who teach you things outside of what music is about, but how to live within our business. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. It's so important. Um, you carry those lessons with you forever. Yes. And, and you bring up Ramsey's name. I, I could go through all the, the, the great people he introduced me to, the amazing experiences. He, 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 led, me to, he led me to somebody else who, who uh, really has shaped Miami's jazz scene. And that's Larry Rosen. I, yeah, yeah. I was the person who got Ramsey on GRP. It's such a fluke, man. I was doing a story on, on GRP's 10th anniversary, I think, and I had Dave Grusin on the phone while I was producing Ramsey Lewis's radio show, trying to set an appointment. And I said, you know, Dave, Ramsey, you know Ramsey Lewis? He doesn't have a, a record deal. And they got their people with their people, and that is how Ramsey Lewis got on GRP, just me being right there doing something for my mentor. And um, 
and connecting people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, Larry, of course, with me being in Miami, uh, we were best, you know, just really great friends. And uh, oh, man. he revered Ramsey. And in fact, the two people that played at, La at Larry's memorial were me and Ramsey. Yeah, oh, man. And then Larry, man. So back to my writing in the book. We, I think yeah, I want to get into this book. Okay, okay, but let me tell you about Larry, man. So my book is Bebop Fairy Tales and Historical Fiction Trilogy on Jazz and Tolerance of Baseball. So Ramsey was, um, I was with Ramsey at, uh, when we were in smooth jazz together and afterwards, I kept writing things. And you know, he, he, got, he had that amazing TV show. Yeah. <laughs> Legends of Jazz with Ramsey Lewis. This yeah. is the complete set, by the way. Wow. But, um, they knew about, Ramsey knew about my, about my interest in screenwriting. This is a great thing for your students too, okay? So I'm, I got this amazing career in the 90s and suddenly I, I found out what I wanna do for a living and it's write screenplays. That is, I mean, and I've been obsessed kind of with, you know, it's my life and I do all these crazy things. I've never, I've been writing screenplays for over 25 years, wow. but, yeah, I, I digress. Let's go with Larry first, and then I'll tell you how Ramsey helped me with the screenplay thing. Ramsey knew my interest in writing, and he did all he could to, to help with that. So when, when he got with GRP, and he had all these amazing projects, he told Larry Rosen and Dave Grusin, I know this guy who knows, you know, you want to do something with Charles Stepney? I know a young man who could talk about Charles Stepney right there, at, you know? And so I got these amazing projects from GRP to research my heroes, to write. There's so many jobs that, well, it's different now, but, but record companies back then, they needed press people. They needed people, and, and to, they still do need people to write about artists. And there's, I started writing bios through Larry Rosen. Larry Rosen always looked out for me writing. When he got that TV show, man, he, he reached out to me and I, he knew I had my interest in screenplays as did Ramsey. And I wrote a couple of those TV shows. Larry Rosen was always looking for opportunities, man. And as Shelly, I think you know about the the count, the um, tribute to Ray Charles. Well, yeah, I I I was the first music director of that show, and you wrote the show, and I exactly exactly the arrangements. So we were working together then. <laughs> hey, man, but that's 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 really cool. I mean, an example of Larry, his huge heart and putting people together, you know, and. Good people begot good people too. I, I really honestly believe that. So Ramsey knew about my writing stuff and um, man, I taught, I was too late in life to like go to school now. So I, I, I did some pretty radical things as my life was developing. I, I took two or three years and there's a guy named Sid Fields who's the how-to guy on screenplays and an amazing screenwriter named William Goldman who has a book called Adventures in the Screen Trade. And I absorbed myself in these guys. And I took a year and a half and I watched over 300 movies wow. and I transcribed them and, you know, and I, you know, and then I lucked up into an amazing screenwriting group. We actually made a movie actually. And, and I, and it was so many people, they were from different magazines, Playboy, the Chicago Reader. And there were so many of us, there was always a screenplay to be talked about, developed. So my first screenplay, you'll love this, Mr. Berg. Maybe one day we could do it. My first screenplay was Fats Waller being kidnapped by Al Capone. Oh, wow. Okay, okay. It was, called, it was called Cash for Your Trash, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and so Ramsey knew that I, I, you know, I had this interest. So we're, we're doing our show interviewing, and there's Terrence Blanchard. And this is like 90, 95, 96. And... Um, I, I tell uh, Terrence about this screenplay and I'm just Ramsey's producer, but because Ramsey trusted me, seemed to, Terrence sight unseen with the screenplay gave me an interest into Spike Lee. I sent Spike the, the screenplay, he loved it. He, he wrote me back and I have the letter somewhere where he said, but you don't give period pieces to uh, independent companies cause we have no, no money. Cause it costs money to recreate. Yeah. yeah. Fast Waller and Al, Al Capone. So um, that's just an example of a, of a mentor helping me even when I 
change when I'm looking for something else to do. And also, don't be afraid to change, you know, changing careers could be could be a hard thing. And I haven't changed my career. But I think this book has helped um, me to maybe see another act. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah, the, the real desire, I still have this burning desire to get into Hollywood and to mix jazz with it. What I know, you know, I can't, I, I, I've been discouraged to not write about history and I, I, I can't. And, and, and this book is kind of a response to Hollywood telling me uh, I'm a nobody and you could never get a chance to write about history um, because, because you don't know anybody. So actually it came from an idea from a guy, again, Shelly, it's hard for me to brag sometimes because I have an Emmy, I have Grammys, so a lot of people don't know that I have had a Sundance Award too. I, I was writing all that time, and in 2003, I was a semifinalist in Sundance. And all that means is I made the first cut, okay? And the first cut is major though, but, uh, and, and I have a friend named Malcolm Jamal Warner, who people know yeah, from the Cosby Show. Yep. And, and he said, man, you have a Robert Redford seeing the Agent Free card. And, you should come to LA and talk to some people. And it kind of turned me off and I got the same message that Spikes gave me. You know, you're a nobody, man. Don't write about history, you know, try something else. And this guy at this party that Malcolm took me to said, you know, there's this movie, Brokeback Mountain. And, you know, it's so hot right now. And it came from a book of short stories. Mm -hmm. And that was the genesis right there. Oh. That, and it took me 17 years ago but, but mostly because my life, you know, I, yeah. I mean, I could dream all I want, you know, but my job is so much fun. What I do for a living is so much fun. I believe if I was really, fr I'm a frustrated screenwriter, but if I had a frustrated job, I may have done more to get, you know, but <laughs> you know what I mean? It happens as it should, you know, so this yeah. is happening now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I love the book and um, even though I'm, you know, a jazz person all my life, you know, it's, you, you read the book and you wonder, well, how much of this was in fact, you can tell what, what's obviously fiction, but like, you know, did Gene Ammons and, and, uh, and Bob Fosse actually serve together in the military? Okay. Okay. Each, each story has its, its And was Joseph Papp actually their commander? That's the funny. Hey, hey man. Okay. So that, I'm glad you went there. Joe Papp was Bob Fosse's station chief in the special special uh, uh, special services in the um, Navy. That's a true fact. There are true facts I cherry picked. The Gene Ammons was in New Orleans in my story because he was in the Billy Eckstein band, that famous bebop band. Right. They had Dexter Gordon and Charlie Parker and Art Blakey, led yeah. by Billy Eckstein, and and that's how they ended up in New Orleans. Now you put them together. Yeah, yes. Now, now Billy Eckstein may or may not have been in New Orleans, but he could have. But he could have. And, and, and oh yeah. So I mean, you know, I, I I use my imagination a lot to build this story. And but again, all those people who were in the band, they were actually in the band. You know. So, yeah. Right. And it seems to me that all these stories have a thread of your life in that. Music is protecting people in all of these stories. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. I, I've been saying it since we've been talking. Music protected me. And, and, and sometimes people, I mean, you write, what, you write what you know, you write what you feel, and the music has protected me. And yes, music, yes. <laughs> you know, it's, I want to get into some of the specifics of the book, but there's a general, there's something also that weaves through the book that I find you write in a very nuanced way. And because there are people in this book who are the worst kind of bigot, and there are people in this book who do their, who really want to do the right thing and want to be a champion for black people. And then there are people who are sort of in between. They're, you know, the, the true fabric of humanity. They're, you know, they're flawed. But, but 
you know, especially at a time right now where there's so much racial acrimony, you really show all kinds of people in this book and you show humanity uh, across the spectrum. And I don't know if that was an intentional thing or born out of your experience. Um, my wife, my wife doesn't like the line that I use, but um, I always thought intolerance is so stupid. And I, I, I've, I've felt that for so long in my life. Um, and, and, and Shelly, I really appreciate the question. It almost makes me emotional because I, I did an interview with a guy, an uh, old friend, Bill King. Do you know Bill King in Toronto, piano player? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so Bill King has a radio show in, uh, in Toronto. And um, he, he, thought, he said to me, he said, you know, man, some of your, some of your topics are hard. You know, you, you may have a lot of wit and it may be funny in history, but have you thought that your friends may not want to talk to you about transgender issues or homophobic issues and, you know, and, and all the, and, 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 and I think from a friend of mine said, maybe it's a reflection of my heart and what I want, what I want to see, but um, I'm glad you picked it out, man. That, that, that means a lot, Shelly, you know? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it makes the book it, hopeful in a way that I think is needed right now. And, and you know what's cool, man? Uh, I worked 17 years on this. It, and it's funny how the impetus that made me finish, that's a whole nother funny story and a story about inspiration. But it, it's a blessing in so many ways that it's out now that it comes at this intersection of not only us talking about race, talking about a, a, a hopeful change, but even baseball is going through some change because of you know the COVID thing. So it, it's ironic. I, I again, I feel like, and and I thought this, yeah, there's music protecting me again. You know, putting me in the conversation. And to your point, I think I don't. There's so many books. You look at Amazon's top ten now, right now, man. There's so many books about race and and, and so many people preaching. I think if you read these stories, and again, man. This just is a happenstance. But I think if you read these stories, I think, you know, I'm not preaching. I'm just showing, I'm just trying, I'm just getting the, the movie scripts that I want to write out. out, in, <laughs> out yeah. you know? I, I feel, I feel it. You um, know, it, but it shows that people have, you know, people have better angels and there are people, you know, that again, we've had mentors and supporters and champions and, and there are people that will be that. And, you know, there's good in the world, and and um, you know this this book gets to that in an interesting way. The third story in the book, it just so brilliantly weaves all these dreams together. It's just so much fun to read. Oh man, uh, Shelly, and again, what's been fun at the initial uh, starting off is getting out. I've been doing shows outside of jazz. I've been I I did a. Um, I did a national talk, black talk show. I did another talk show. I did a Canadian sports show. Um, but the first time I did a show with someone who re actually read the book was on Major League Baseball, and it was Rico Petroselli. <laughs> I the remember Rest hey, yeah. Dave, dig, dig this. He's a major jazz head, man. He told me wow. stories about how they used to go hang. He plays piano and drums, and he was tight with Buddy Rich. Okay? okay. That is wild. So, yes, exactly. So... So I appreciate that you read the book. The, the, there's so much about the last story that means so much to me. Um, so much happened in 1964. Now you talk about weaving historical events. Exactly, that, that year and then their sports and, and jazz and the world situation all oh. woven together. Well, I mean, the list is incredible. The Civil Rights Act was passed. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King got the Nobel Peace Prize. Muhammad Ali changed his name. Sam Cooke was killed. Uh, not so long after Malcolm X was killed. Um, M Nelson Mandela went to jail. Uh, it's on and on. And, and, and not long ago, uh, not before that, a uh, time before that, uh, President Kennedy had just got killed. You know, yeah. you know so uh, again, ironic that it came out at this time, that story called The Sidewinder. It begins a week after a woman named Odessa Bradford was harassed by the police. Yep. Just, it's, it's such a reflection of what's going on now. I, I know. And I, 
And then, uh, and then you and I are in that story. I mean, there's a guy named Sean Berg, who's a musician. <laughs> Willie that has the record store and wants to be the record producer. <laughs> Couldn't play as well. Yeah, I, I, honestly, <laughs> honestly, Shelly, I didn't even think about that till right now. So that is not you, okay? But wow. <laughs> okay, wait. Wow. Okay, now I got to think. How did I come up with Berg? Gosh, I can't remember. You, you know, you know, I had to, I, it, it was, I had to make it as, as, for lack of a better term, you know, make the, the character is Jewish kid. And I felt like maybe I couldn't lose with Berg, you know? Uh, but no, it's not, it's not you, Dean Berg. <laughs> well, I was a Jewish kid who was very interested in hanging out with the, uh, with the black musicians that, you know, because that's how I learned my craft, you know. <laughs> I was studying classical music at the Cleveland Institute. I was, you know, sneaking out with my dad, you know. So, I mean, you, you know, it's funny. It, it, I'm so glad you brought it up. I mean, because the story is about a black kid from one side of Philadelphia and a Jewish kid from another side of Philadelphia. Yeah. But it was the music that drew that Jewish kid to right. to to outside of his classical universe, you know. And and again, there I, I don't want to give much of the story away, but yeah. but but there's a point where in the story when he's watching the Lee Morgan Quartet practice yeah. outside, there's a point where he his mind was, you know, it was like, wait. I've never seen musicians play standing up. His classical world was different right. and he couldn't he couldn't put it together and and doubted if they were they were playing right. But it sounded so good to him, it didn't matter. Yeah, the the book, you know, the the it it almost like a symphony, you know, the second movement, which is the second story, is different than the other two. It doesn't have as much humor. It therefore it's not as long. Um, it takes you to a place of reflection, and then opens you back up for the third one. At least that's how how I took it. Oh, Shelley Berg, man, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, again, uh, Shelley, not I, I've done so many interviews, man, with folks that just you know they actually read the press release that the publicist as they're introducing me. So this is so refreshing. Um, that story has a life of its own, Shelley. Yeah. Um, I would have been done with the book much sooner had I not had another brush with Hollywood. I, I've been fortunate, man, one of the coolest gigs a music nerd could get. Do you guys have a, you guys must have a film school. Down sure. There. You must. Yeah. Music supervision for a music oh, nerd. Yeah. Oh my God. Shelly, Shel you'll love this. So, I did music supervision for Julia Stiles film. It's called The Drowning. And it started with, I had the keys to Concord's vaults. Wow. And I built this incredible soundtrack going through, Con it was so much fun, oh, yeah. but, but it didn't, um, I ended up doing something else. But um, through, through that experience, through a friend at Columbia College who took an interest in my writing, um, I was, working on the book and I had my Columbia professor friend read the story and and she gave it to a couple of her students one name uh former students a guy named Zachary Quinto he's an actor he was in a show called Heroes uh-huh he's also Spock in Star Trek oh wow and and this guy who worked for him uh read my story he, he was amazing he said Man, it's a gay story. It's a black story. It's a straight story. It's a jazz story. It's a baseball story. I mean, he he yeah. he, he, gave, he was so excited, man. And so, they offered me an option, to which is money. An option is they give you money to hold it yeah. for a while, and then if they don't, you get the rights back. But I told them, no, I'm a screenwriter. I'm a frustrated screenwriter. Let me write it. So we worked on it for two and two and a half years until they. Um, lost interest, but it was very exciting. They tried to give me fellowships and tried to raise money. It was very exciting. In the end, I have a finished screenplay of that second story. So when I finished the book in January, when I was all done, um, I searched around for screenplay competitions. And I'm 
doing really well in one right now. So, oh, that's great. So yeah. that's great. Well, um, you get to know these characters. You know, they they have a lot of texture and a lot of depth, and you really get to know them, and um, you really get involved in the story. It's a book you can't put down when you when you start to read it, and. Uh, Thank you, know, you Shelly. I, I just loved having the opportunity, and that, that second story is so important of a of a you know man discovering his gayness, his sexuality, and and how jazz you know played a role in it. You know, and I don't want to give the story away, but but all that is just you know fascinating. And he gave up a lot, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you did you see, you may have noticed I dedicate I dedicate the people who inspired the story. There's a dedication at the beginning of the book. Um, and for that story, it was Panonica. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, and, and because Panonica's life changed so much through the music of Thelonious Monk. I remember in the record store when I was a kid, man, the, in, the, the, I think it's the in action with, with him, with the plate, he's in a little red wagon. wagon. I was scared of that, man. Okay, you know? <laughs> and, and, and eventually I got past that you know, when I got to be a preteen, but I remember being afraid of that record and, and with her life. And if, if man, the, the bio is an HBO special called the Baroness. That's the name of it. Yeah. It is a great film about her life. Yeah. People should check and, her out because some of the people watching this podcast may not know who she was, the Baroness Panonica to Koenigswalder, but she was, she was the champion of the jazz musicians and, uh, she went, to, um, she went to jail for Monk. Yeah. Yeah. And, and okay, again, those folks who don't know, there's been songs named for her. Nika's the most Dream. famous, Nika's yeah. Dream. That's right. Um, but, but, and, and so, and, and I have a friend, another friend who had some crazy adventures in, in uh, Mississippi. I mean, crazy. So I thought about what if a guy from the South, had his life suppressed and somehow saw Monk. Right. And brilliant. that was that was the genesis of the story. It was brilliant. And, uh, the, you know, they're, they're all great. I really recommend the book. The first story is just so much fun with Bob Fosse and, and Gene Ammons thrown together with these outrageous New Orleans characters uh, <laughs> and an amazing adventure. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much, Shelly. Uh, I, ha I had fun writing. It took a long time. Um, I, I, man, you must, when you teach, talk about inspiration. Absolutely. It's a core thing. It, it, but it's amazing where it comes from sometimes, too, mm -hmm. you know? Um, for me, finishing this book. And this book is all I, I mean, for a while, I just, you know, again, my, my life and my job is Sirius XM. It's very demanding. You know that, Shelly. Oh, you it's, know that. It's very demanding. And how I found the time and still to have a, uh, and, and to be a recent married man, you know, it, it was just hard to find the, the time to, uh, to find the time to write. And <clears throat> sometimes an idea can get a hold of you. And an idea won't let you go. So I've been working on this book for, for 13, 14 years. Then I got that opportunity. It took two years to write the screenplay, you know, and I, I love the screenplay. Uh, um, you'll appreciate this cause, and I don't think it's a, it'll, it'll spoil the story. The thing, when I worked with these guys with the screenplay, what I didn't notice about the second story, Shelly, is it doesn't have a strong woman. And that's the difference in the screenplay. Okay, yes. it does, it, it, there, there's a strong woman character, but <clears throat> with with that story, uh, I, I'm sorry, I forgot my point. Yeah, what well, what's the question? I forgot my point because I started to think about the screenplay and the woman. Um, that's a good question. I got so involved in, in what you were saying. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, oh, I know inspiration. There we go. Inspiration, right? Yes. So. I wanted to do something else. This story, what will now be my second novel, bothered me so much. It, the character started talking to me. It, and, and 
it it just consumed me, man. And and um, it got to be so much. I, I go to sleep fantasizing. I've been doing that since I've been wanting to write movies. And I think one of the reasons the stories move so well in the book is because I look at it as a movie. I use some of the same mm -hmm. uh, devices that you use in a movie. And, and, and characters started talking to me in this novel that I wanted to write uh, that's based in Toronto. So much so, man, that um, I started writing the book. Now here I've been on a project 13 years and I started writing another book. And my wife did not dig it. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a friend, Renee Marie, who, who sat me her. down. Yes, I love her too, man. I, we didn't talk about producing records, but the first record I produced, she was on it 20 years ago. It's been a dear friend ever since. And I started telling her about the story. And then I told her the Round Midnight Ku Klux Klan story. She said, you know, that story that's inspiring you right now, that story is going to stay with you and it is never going to go away. Mm -hmm. But if you don't finish what you started, right. you know, uh, you're going to, you, you know, I won't be able to tell that whole story. The words she said so inspired me and made me wonder how that inspiration thing worked. I went home and I wrote the outline for the second story. It was something like 40, between 40 and 50 pages. That's how this fully formed story came. But it, 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 I want to get to that story so bad, I finished the book. I don't know if I would have finished if I wasn't inspired to get to the next story. That's great. Well, it's, uh, it's amazing how this time flies by, but I, um, I, I just, uh, I'm really glad we had a chance to talk about this. I think your book uh, is an important read right now, like I said, because through all the um, lack of humanity that you get to see, you get to see the other side and you get to see the hope and you get to see people who, who not only persevere, but they find a way to thrive uh, come out of their adversity and thrive. And I mean, that's what living is all about, right? Thank you, Shelly. So, you know, I, you know, people, you, you may not believe this, but some people thought it was a book about kids because of the title, Bebop Fairy Tales. <laughs> but if you look at it, I think the title says a lot about it, an historical fiction trilogy on jazz and tolerance and baseball. And I just appreciate that you got it, man. Thank well, you. you know, you said intolerance is stupidity. But, uh, you know, I agree. The, the definition of bigotry is ignorance. Because if you really know, how could you possibly paint with such a broad brush about any race, ethnicity, religion, you know, anything. So any kind of bigotry is by definition ignorance. Thank you, Mr. Berg. So That's right. Thank you for shining a beautiful light in this world right now, Mark Ruffin. Hey man, so so do you kid do your kids know that you have a radio show on Sirius XM? Yeah. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> and first Saturday every month, nine a.m. Saturday every night month. Eastern. Yeah, okay. And Generation sure. Next, I get to interview a young uh, jazz artist, and we talk about their influences and their music, and I love doing it, and. Uh, I appreciate you and I appreciate Sirius XM for giving me that uh, format because that's been my life work 40 years as an educator. So yeah, man. Yeah. I love getting well, to do it. Well, good luck to you on the podcast, man. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for being with me and being on this podcast. And I look forward to seeing you back in New York as soon as I can. Absolutely, man. Take Thank care. You,